19, the final chapter. Yay. Yay. Uh, planning, zoning, and environmental hazards. Good news is we don't get into depth in this class. This section doesn't go into depth. It's not like the broker horse. Broker horse has a lot on environmental hazards. We're going to hit the basics, and that's it. So what is planning, zoning? We're talking about development, right? We're talking about, we're going back to way back in the beginning when we talked about dedication of land. Remember that? Mm -hmm. What's dedication? We're dedicating part of the area to the public. Right. Use. So a percentage of land for development, you're giving it to public to build infrastructure, roads, roads, sidewalks, everything else, roads. right? Yeah. Utility easements, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. That's, so it's all coming full circle now to the end, right? So we're talking about planning zoning. So first of all, we have this Community Planning Act, right? Florida's growth policy. We're talking about building. So D.R. Horton built this, they bought this land behind us years ago, right? Years and years ago, I'm talking like a decade ago, they bought this land. You see they're just now developing it over here, right? Well, the reason they had a problem is because Bay Meadows Roads is only two lanes wide on both sides, right? right? So we had to figure out, do we have enough infrastructure in place to support the extra homes that are going out? Sewers, solid weight treatment. Do we have enough room for the extra traffic flow, right? Water usage, all this stuff matters, right? Because it's gonna affect everybody. So it's called concurrency. This, this term concurrency refers to, do we have the infrastructure in place to handle the new development? So part of the reason it took so long is because we didn't have anywhere to go. So they had to appeal and appeal and try to get an approval, an exception. All right, we're gonna talk about exceptions on this too. So this Community Planning Act placed growth and planning responsibilities on the local government. So the city of Jacksonville in this case is who's going to approve this. We're not going to go to the state. To the state. Because why? Because the state mandated concurrency is not required for public transportation, Absolutely. schools, parks, etc. Downsize the state growth planning and now we're doing this on the local level. So that's that's the whole point of this this act, right? Well, real time we're seeing it right outside the windows here. So why did we go to the city level? Because it's saving us money, right? It saves taxpayers money, prevents this thing called sprawl. Sprawl, we all. Sprawl, right? Provides adequate provision of services, the right of ways, setbacks. See, each, each county is gonna have different setback requirements. Right? So a lot of places your driveway has to be 22 feet, for example, right? But if you go to Atlantic Beach, I sold a property that had five feet on one side, 10 feet on one side, and 20 feet on one side. So different sides of the lot because of the type of road frontage it has may have different setbacks. This helps protect us against costly drainage, flooding, and environmental problems because it's done locally. And it reduces those problems exist with existing landfills and prisons, etc. Right? The more people we have, right, the more crime we're gonna have, the more waste we're gonna have. All this stuff's gotta go somewhere. So Okay. That's why it's important for the city to be the one that's looking at this because what if it's some really rural area in central Florida that nobody really cares if they build 10 more houses or 20 more houses or 100 more houses. But here, where we have a million people, it may cause an overflow. So we have this planning commission downtown, right? It's a diverse group of appointed people. They're not elected, they're appointed. They're voluntary, this is a voluntary job, and they're not paid. Advisory body to the electric bill uh, officials. So basically you have these council people and you have these, these advisors to the council people, and that's what this is. That's what the city planning division is. So what can they do? What do they do? They approve subdivision site plans and sign control, right? So when you get your signs pulled, because you put signs where you're not supposed to, and you're violating the sign ordinance, just know this has to come back to the planning commission, right? So one sign in the wrong place is $300 fine. Right? Multiple signs can add up quickly. 
you didn't open house and you didn't do your signs right, you put them on the right of way, you, get fined. you can get 10 signs would be a $3,000 fine. Well, I just didn't open house and I might make $3,000 when I just lost all my money and I didn't even make any. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's important that you follow sign ordinance laws. Side plan approval, subdivision plat. Remember we talked about that? So plat's wet, it's when you put all the lots and the, block, the lots and blocks together on a subdivision map. That's what it is. <clears throat> all the way from the very beginning of the class, we have this slide, right? How big is one acre? Remember this from townships? 43,560. 43, why is this important? Because we're going to use this calculation to calculate the number of buildable lots in a subdivision. The land available for lots, the percentage of land available for lots is what? It's total number minus the dedicated portion gives you the total amount of land we can build on, right? Because dedication is used for all the infrastructure that we need for concurrency, right? See, it's all coming together now? Right. Square, feetage of, square feet available times acres in the track gives you your total available square foot, and then the square foot divided by the minimum square foot per lot is the billable lots. Now, who establishes the, the, the minimum square foot per lot? Well, that's part of the planning division, right? Because they're saying, okay, well, if we're low density, then we have to have 8,000 square foot lots, for example, right? If we're high density, maybe we have to have 4,000 square foot lots. Right? 40 by 100 is tight. But there's areas of Springfield that have 40 by 80 lots, 3,200 square foot. Your house is 2,700 square foot, it's not going to fit on a 3,200 square foot lot. Right? So here's calculating lots per acre. We'll run quickly through this example and then we'll do a math question on it after we finish the rest of the chapter. So a tract of land consists of 120 acres. Zoning requires 10,000 square foot per lot, so that's almost a quarter acre per lot. 20% of the tract is to be set aside for streets and sidewalk. What's that 20% called? Dedication, Dedication. right? 43,560 times the 80% for the land available in lots, you get 34,848 square foot of lots per acre, but you got 120 acres, so that's 4,200,000 Square feet available divided by 10,000 gives you 418 lots. Okay. Now, the opposite of doing the tax assessment, when we do the fraction thereof, $100 to fraction thereof, you round up for every penny. When it's buildable lots, if it's less than the number, you round down. So if you had 9,000 square feet less, you have to round down right. because there's a minimum. 9,900 is less than 10,000. Mm -hmm. Even though it's big enough to build a house on, it's not big enough per the planning division. Right. So we add that. What we're gonna do is probably add it to 10 lots at nine, yeah, extra 100 feet a lot or something like that. Mm -hmm. no. Or 100 lots, extra 100 feet a lot, something like that, right? That's how this whole planning works, zoning here. Local laws that regulates the comprehensive plan, exercise of police power. We're regulating that permissible use of land, lot sizes, types of structures, building heights, setbacks, and density. So if you go to say Phoenix, Arizona, you know, they have a they have a sign ordinance that says your signs can only be so high. So when you go to like McDonald's, you know, on the interstate, you see this sign that's like six thousand feet high, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go to Phoenix, you'll see it and it's it's just above the building. <laughs> because the sign ordinance says you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well that's part of the zoning requirements, right? Now it's not here, but that would be say Maricopa County or something like that, right? So zoning also regulates the density. Remember, we, I briefly mentioned low density, high density. They have different types of densities for different areas. Would you say that the Bay Meadows and 9A corridor is high density or low density? Think about what's over there. Condos, mm -hmm. everywhere. So high density. So it's high density, right? Because you have more. You have more Would built. you say that way out in Middleburg is high density or low density? Low. It's low density, yeah. right? Because you got a bunch of dirt roads with big lots, right? Lots. Like two, three acre, four acre, five acre lots. One right? acre, five acre lots. Right. right. Yeah, so, true. so that's low density, relatively speaking, to 
Or a condo where you might have 30 of them on an acre. Right. You know? That's real high density, yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Downtown, the high rises. Yeah. High Burke density. and Plaza. Burke and Plaza, right? Yeah. You got, what, 20 stories of condos? Mm -hmm. oh, or yeah. on the river walk, you got these 10 story buildings. That's higher density than Deerwood. Right. Right? Yeah. So that's what we're talking about zoning. So it's regulated density, subcategories, minimum lot sizes. We talked about minimum lot sizes. Some areas have small lot sizes, some areas have minimum of acre lot sizes. Okay, that's right. Then we have the number of units per acre that are allowed. When you say low density, maybe we only allow four. Versus downtown, we might have 12. Then we have other zoning classifications like commercial, right? Commercial regulates the traffic. And we have this thing called a buffer zone. When you go into a lot of neighborhoods, you'll see like this tree line, mm -hmm. right? With a berm, a big hill. Even over here, if you go down Bay Meadows and you look to the left, Deerwood's on your left, but there's a big hill and you see trees in the fence. Yeah. You don't see anything else. That's a buffer zone. Um, so buffer zone keeps people separate. It's like when you have a preserve in the middle, there's a buffer zone between the houses. Mm -hmm. What does that do? That lowers the intensity of not only visually, but sounds, right? Industrial regulating intensity, then we have an agricultural and special use in government properties. All this stuff falls under zoning. Government properties would be like what? The courthouse downtown, mm -hmm. right? Agricultural is where the cows are. What are building codes? This all falls under this planning stuff. Building codes are established to protect the public. Just like the FREC is here to protect the public and to foster education, building codes are here to protect public health and safety. Right? Building codes are gonna get those minimum standards. For example, we're not allowed to use polyethylene pipes anymore. We're not allowed to use cloth wrapped wires or even aluminum wires anymore. They're, they're going to copper, right? So they're phasing things out, right? They're using arc fault detectors now, or arc fault breakers instead of just your normal GFIs. Minimum standards for materials and quality of workmanship, sanitary equipment, electrical wiring, and fire prevention. So that's what the building codes are for. Statewide Florida building codes, R values. R values refers to the thickness of insulation. So you have R13, R19, R30, ceiling sometimes. Wind loads has to do with mitigation for the roof, putting the right clips on there so hurricanes don't blow it off. Tie down straps for 150,000, or sorry, 150 mile hurricane winds, hmm. right? That's what this all falls under. Codes enforced by local governments, building permits, building inspections, and CO, CO, certificate of occupancy. If you sell new construction, you're always going to hear about certificate of occupancies because you can't close on the house till you have a CO. We can't get a CO till all the minimum standards are done. The punch list does not matter. It's the main stuff. Are the permits done? Is the concrete poured? Is the landscape in? Why landscape? Because when they cut the trees down in these neighborhoods, they have to replace so much wood. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about that. So they do That's that. why they put so many trees in the yards because they have to they have to have enough wood replacement to offset what they take out. Took down. Oh, okay. Right. Zoning board of adjustment, types of appeals, requests and relief. So you can get variances. Variances means I can get a minor deviation to what the norm is, right? So if you have a home office, sometimes they'll give you a zoning variance so that you can run your business out of your home. All right. A lot of real estate agents have home offices. They run their they run their corporate office out of their house. Now they do have to have an established room with signage and everything else. They can't just like have a bedroom with a bed in there. You're not negotiating deals where there's a bed in there. If you are, there's probably a problem. Um, hardships related to land use, and then there's a there's some established criteria, right? But you have to have a hearing and you have to talk about you know why this is going to be beneficial or why it's not. Special exceptions, we have a separate use for a specific parcel. So you get one exception for one particular parcel. That's what a special exception. And then we have this called legally non-conforming use, right? That means that you can, you, I like to use the example of. 
that guy had a residential house in the middle of this whole commercial area, right? He was grandfathered in mm -hmm. to the old usage for the area because that's what it was previously. So that's what a legally non-conforming use. Change the zoning code causes the property to no longer conform, right? Everything else around turned commercial. Mm -hmm. So now his, in theory, would be commercial. But because he was there and he was already residential, he's he being grandfathered in, right? That's why they couldn't force him to move. Yeah. Developments of regional impact, DRI, any development that because of character, size, location, will have a substantial effect on health safety. That's supposed to be health, not heat. Mm -hmm. Safety or welfare of citizens in one one county. So this is your state line, state guidelines. Shopping centers, malls, attractions, sporting facilities like Jaguar Stadium. This is going to bring additional traffic. It's going to affect the public, right? So this, they always they regulate this as well. Got it. Plan unit developments. So plan unit developments. Almost every neighborhood nowadays is a plan unit development. Right? Right. Not the old ones, but it's cluster homes that look like cookie cutter, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Higher density, larger green spaces, right between the clusters. Like our mailbox, for example, my house has Adirondack chairs, pergolas, garden, all this stuff to make it look nice because you've got a high density of homes and then no green areas. So they've designated these little green areas around clustered mailboxes in this example, right? Then you have something that's like mixed land use, beach walk, oak leaf, They've got, mm -hmm. they've got restaurant areas, shopping commercial, areas, residential. commercial, residential, townhouses, apartment homes, townhouses, condos, houses. and houses all together. This is mixed use. Mixed one, no. That's what mixed use is. But they have these planned open spaces, right? Mm -hmm. That's all this PUD is. It's like a big master community. Aberdeen, Trailmark, Oakleaf, Nogatee, they're all PUDs. I'm not sure why flood insurance comes at this point, but flood insurance, the NFIP National Flood Insurance Program is run by FEMA, right? Insurance available to owners, tenants, businesses, community if the community part participates in this national flood uh, insurance program, right? So participating communities agree to adopt these ordinances that meet FEMA requirements to reduce the risk of flooding. So it's all administered by FEMA. All this flood insurance is administered by FEMA. Insurance is purchased through your insurance company. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that the most flood insurance you can get in the state of Florida is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, if you have a million dollar home, you can only cover two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And that's paying for the flood insurance. We well, yeah, that's not what the premium is. That's the actual flood damage is what we're paying for. If you own a condo in a flood zone. The master insurance policy. So there's two. There's two. There's two insurance policies. There's a master insurance policy that covers the buildings and the grounds, right? Then there's, they call it walls out, covers the roof, covers the structures, etc. Then you have an HO6 policy, which is your walls in, right? It covers your sheetrock in, right? The paint on the sheetrock, not the sheetrock, the, sheet, the paint on the sheetrock in, right? Appliances, personal coverage, stuff like that, right? Inside, right? Then they have this thing called an RCBAP. Residential Condo Association biz, uh, Building Policy. What that is, is it's a building blanket flood policy. So when you're getting a loan, that portion of it is done through FEMA, yeah. right? That portion of it's done through the insurance company, but it's administered by FEMA. There's a lot of problems getting loans with condos that don't have sufficient RC DAP. Is that why the majority of them are not approved? No, that's a different reason. It has to do with investor concentration, it has to do with loan types. Got it. Right. So, flood insurance rate maps are here. So, you know, FEMA period periodically changes these flood maps. They can do things like in my neighborhood where what they did was they brought in about eight feet of dirt and they built up the neighborhood. So, it built it up high enough where you get this thing called an elevation cert. The elevation certificate will pull you out of the flood zone. Because maybe in the 100 year flood plan, it only floods three feet high. Well, if they build it up eight feet, then you still have five feet of elevation. Does that make sense? 
So that's what a lot of these things are doing. So that my my house was actually in a flood zone, but because they built up the neighborhood, put a bulkhead in, I don't have to worry about it. And when we had the hurricane, we still had about that much space before it would have gone over the bulkhead. So it worked. Mm -hmm. right? FEMA prepares a flood insurance and rate maps, firms, flood insurance rate maps, firms, another acronym. For every city and county in the U.S., you can actually go on FEMA's website and pull this stuff up. It identifies flood zones as firm as low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. High risk is going to be flood zone A and flood zone V. Flood zone V is coastal. Flood zone A is everything else that's near the water. All right. You're going to see AE, VE, different, different levels, but if it's A or B, it's a 100-year floodplain, you have to have flood insurance. <clears throat> if it's X, it's a 500-year floodplain, you don't have to have flood insurance. The thing about Florida is everybody says, well, I'm not in a flood zone. Yeah, you're in a flood zone. You're just not in a flood zone that requires flood insurance. Right. Florida's a flood zone. <laughs> I mean, flood zone X. That's like saying, I'm in central Illinois. I'm not going to worry about floods. What are you talking about? There's nowhere for that water to go. We're less likely to flood here than we are in mm -hmm. the plains. Right. Because our water has somewhere to go. It runs off. It saturates or it doesn't really get saturated, or it goes through the limestone, and it goes into the aquifer, and we're done, right? Florida's floating. It's like a floating isthmus. So high flood zones are called special flood hazard areas. They're located in the 100-year floodplain. We just talked about Z and A, and A, right? High risk flood areas like San Marco would be A. Mm -hmm. High risk coastal areas like Ponte Vedra Beach would be V, mm -hmm. right? because it's coastal. Buildings put in V must be elevated, anchored, protect, protect against impact of waves, hurricane force, winds, erosion. As you go further south, you'll see a lot of houses on stilts. Mm -hmm. right. They're on pilings, right? Yeah. That's what this is. That's the requirement of flood zone V. Well, that's why they're, they're flood zone A, we don't have to have that, but we have to have flood insurance. Right? But you'll see people putting bulkheads up, sandbags, etc. Comprehensive environmental resource respo or re response Compensation and Liability Act, this is CERCLA, this has to do with hazardous waste cleanup, right? Environmental core samples. Potentially responsible people. So the person that buys the house could be responsible. The person that sells it could be responsible. Whoever's liable for cleanup costs. So um, previous owner could be on the hook for it. A new owner could be on the hook for it. It depends on how their disclosures are put out. It's directed as joint, several, and it's retroactive. So you could be liable for not removing the gas tanks off your property if you sold it to somebody unknowingly. Mm -hmm. You didn't disclose it, right? If you disclosed it, then guess what? This innocent landowner community is going to go away. They're going to have to do it because they were told. Mm -hmm. right? And then there's a priorities list. We won't really talk about that. Environmental hazards. Asbestos, we all know what asbestos is. Mm -hmm. It's a material that's cancerous that was in like insulation and tiles and everything else. Roof siding, I mean, our house siding, right? Radon. Radon. Radon is the colorless, odorless gas that comes out of the earth, seeps through the foundation, and gives you cancer, right? Lead based paint is paint with lead in it that before 1978, we have to disclose that there could be lead-based paint in the house, right? Anything built 77 and prior, we have to get an addendum saying that there could be lead-based paint in this house. Right. You have the right to assess it because why? It causes cancer. See all this stuff causes some, causes <coughs> public some safety? Public These are safety. big ones. So when you don't get the right disclosures and somebody gets sick, they can sue you. Mold, there's two types of houses in Florida, moldy houses and houses that will get it eventually, mm -hmm. right? because we're wet. And the way they're built. Water supply, if there's an environmental hazard for, around water, and then wood destroying organisms. What are wood destroying organisms? Everybody says termites. Well, it's also fungus wood decay, right? Rotting. It could be carpenter ants, could be uh, beetles, wood boring beetles. It could be any of these things, much. right? Those are wood destroying organisms. If there's a, a report that comes out and you see bad wood, we have to fix it, right? We don't have to fix it, if it's a certain type of loan, but we should. So remember this whole 
flood insurance rate maps, right? Rent letters are reviewing the flood insurance issues, right? Structures in AMV that are financed are required to have flood insurance, right? Flood insurance is available for property located in low risk and moderate risk areas as well, as long as they participate in this national flood insurance program. Can you go back to the last slide? Uh, let's see. Maybe. The only question I have was, um, if it's financed, what if your house is well, I don't need the slide like, for that. paid off? Or, if your if house is paid cash? off, you do not have to have flood insurance. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have homeowner's insurance. Right. I bought a house a couple of years ago with no homeowner's insurance because I was buying it to flip. Mm -hmm. So I bought it. And then I sold it to somebody else, and they got insurance. But I put a new roof on it, new AC, new. But the whole time it was all redone. But the whole time I lived there, I didn't have insurance. So I'm guessing 